I mean, I absolutely love part of what you brought out in one of your talks at uh, LICC, um, which was, um, and I'm sure you, you, and you mentioned in other places as well, uh, that the first, you know, out and out atheist was a cleric whose manuscript is only found, you know, underneath his bed after his death. Uh, and it made, uh, I think you put it, uh, it, it made the God delusion seem entirely reasonable, uh, a calm and, you know, rationalistic approach to religion. Right. John Meslier's Testament, it's uh, a, a work of um, considerable anger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was a historian's review, very <laughs> considered. <laughs> uh, and the interesting thing was, it, it was known at the time, and it was picked up, and Voltaire published a version of him. But Voltaire hated atheists almost as much as he hated Catholics. Voltaire was a deist, and he turned Meslier into a deist. So it, it, he, he retained um, its viciously anti-clerical and in many ways anti-Jewish elements, cleared away the atheism, and inserted a deistic kind of a belief in a, in a, in a natural first cause God into it. So Meslier was known, but the true severity of his criticism, in fact, it wasn't just anti-clerical, there was a lot of anti-clericalism at the time, but it was actually atheistic, wasn't known until much, much later. Well, that is interesting that someone like Voltaire is rebelling against the, the religious context that he's in, but also retaining some general belief in God. What, were the, um, what was the reaction to these I'll group them as Enlightenment skeptics. I'm not sure that really makes sense, but you know there was there were these people who um, seemed to have that those kind of views. What what were the Enlightenment skeptics' views on Christianity, uh, specifically including Trinity, the resurrection, um, you know, justification through faith alone? Um, I, the first response to that is that there is a spectrum of these Enlightenment radicals, um, and so there isn't a single kind of response they have. On one end, you would get the most vigorously anti-Christian and indeed, obviously anti-clerical, but anti-God mm. thinkers. So um, someone like uh, Baron de Holbach would probably be the, the, the best example of this, mm. who um, had, can have no truck with any form of religious belief, creed whatsoever. Um, and there are um, others like him, like um, La Maitre is a, a physician who writes a, a, an extraordinary book called Man, a Machine, which is published in about 1750 or so, which effectively argues that, as you kind of expect from the title, that humans are nothing but machines. And that cuts the ground away from morality, mind, will, soul, God, religion. Mm -hmm. So you get really radical to think like that. Then a bit less radical, you get people like Diderot, who is probably an atheist, at least at the end of his life, but, but um, flirts with, with, with deism. What unites these groups is that they see specific Christian creeds as superstitious nonsense. So the Trinity is, uh, is, it makes no sense and is anyway made up after the scriptures were. Miracles are um, very hard to credit, although it's actually Hume, of course, who gives the most kind of cogent argument against miracles. So they agree on the falsity and sometimes the absurdity of specific creedal claims, but they disagree on whether there is anything more um, deistic, abstract about the possibility of a first cause mm -hmm. behind them. What were those radical? What was the uh, response of those radicals to Islam? Even though they may have had limited understanding of it, how do they treat Islam similarly or differently to how they treated Christianity? Um, well, you're right. Firstly, they had much less understanding of it. Um, secondly, and this is very important, Islam was out there. Mm. They lived under a, a, a Catholic regime in France, so w one was knowledge of, or knowledge of at second hand and the other was experience of. Mm. And that possibly underlies um, a, a common, but not universal reaction, that um, Islam was more intellectually robust um, and also intellectually freer than the circumstances in which they lived. So sometimes the philosophers would, as it were, weaponize Islam against the Catholic regime in which they lived. They didn't know, it was a very ahistorical and, and, and actually quite an ill-informed weaponization, 
but it was used by some at least to attack the intellectually oppressive culture in which they lived. And they, I, I remember they also, um, a lot of the secularists looked at the example of the Ottomans and said, um, you know, they seem to permit, because they had such a big kingdom, they seem to permit all these different religions. And here in, in their country, for instance, their political leaders weren't doing the same. And they would kind of make that comparison to try and embarrass their leaders. Uh, yes, I mean, em embarrass is a nice way of putting it. I think they were, <laughs> I think they were trying to more, more than embarrassing them. They were absolute, absolutely shaming them. But again, we come back to this critical point of the level, extent to which there's intellectual freedom there. And I think it's very telling that in many ways, in the 18th century, Britain can boast two of the most sceptical minds in Europe, Edward Gibbon and David Hume. Mm. And yet neither of them come out as atheists, neither of them are atheists. And I think one of the reasons for that is that they're, they're not really pushed to atheism by the culture in which they live. They certainly come under a lot of attack, of course they do. But they live, broadly speaking, in a comparatively intellectually tolerant milieu. And they don't have um, as it were, uh, an, an aggressively, narrowly Christian culture to get their teeth into. So, so much of this it depends on, effect effectively, if systems can't bend, they break. Mm. And they could bend in 18th century Britain. Mm. That was much more brittle in 18th century France. And that's so interesting because all those names you, you gave, those you know, French thinkers, La Maitre and... Uh, um, Diderot and Holbach. Diderot and Holbach. And, yeah. They are all French names. And um, you mentioned also uh, polythesis that in the UK, atheism was much more, and it, when it did develop, it was much more of a working class phenomenon, and that it was related to um, the economic plight of people with free market capitalism, and the view that actually the church was aligned with the state and was actually indifferent to the needs of the many. Um, and that is just so interesting that... <clears throat> You know, you do have the growth of atheism in the UK, but it's of a completely different nature. It's less intellectual, it's less philosophical, um, it's much more to do with the ordinary person. Mm. That's right, it's a fascinating story. That the, you know, the first person British uh, thinker uh, you'd associate really, really prominently with atheism is probably Bertrand Russell in the 20th century. Even John Stuart Mill is a kind of a, a, a theist in the 19th century. You get this fascinating seesaw. So France erupts in, into revolution and, and, and then kind of Napoleonic conquest at the end of the 18th century. Britain finds itself at war with France for a whole generation. To be British was not to be French. And it had been for much of the 18th century, but even more at the beginning of the 19th century. Who do we blame for the barbarism into which France has degenerated. Well, it's obviously it's the philosoph, isn't it? It's because these are, the, these are the people who intellectually laid the, laid the groundwork for what happened um, in, the, in, the, in the 1790s. 1815, Britain comprehensively conquers, or finishes off Napoleon, but in the post-Napoleonic periods, you have a reassertion of quite rigid political authority um, free market capitalism, which is a slightly anachronistic way of putting it, um, liberalism it is, is, is uh, economic liberalism, I think, uh, re asserts itself as, as, as dominant in the 1820s and 30s. This is a period of um, obviously urbanisation, industrialisation, and it is all marked with the imprimatur of the established church, which only very reluctantly begins to unpeel its fingers from the, from, from political authority in, the 20s and 30s. in other words, the same causes that provoked atheism in 18th century France are actually present in 19th century Britain, but there's a class element built into it. 